Yeah. And I'm going to uh, mute everyone. The Baptism of the Holy Spirit, part two, for radical disciples during these very, very last days. If you'd like to have the, these sessions for radical disciples, that is uh, the playlist of YouTube videos and the accompanying PowerPoint presentations, uh, simply email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. My WhatsApp is plus one two eight one five zero seven eight five one seven. I will repeat this information at the very end of the hour. I'd like to begin with some scriptures for us to consider. Now, the following scriptures, I think, are very rarely taught, but let's look at them. Mark 10, verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, came to the Lord. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. That is, in his kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? I believe he was referring to his suffering on the cross. We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. So indeed, James and John were later martyred for their faith. Uh, excuse me, uh, not John. Uh, John was on the island of Patmos, and through John, we have the book of Revelation. So, But uh, James, I believe, was. Now, verse 40, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And so my question is, do you want to be seated as close as possible to the Lord in his kingdom, if not at his right or at his left, after he comes in his glory? Yeah, think about that. Would you like to be seated as close as possible to the Lord? And if we do, what do we need to do in this life? Okay, let's go on to part two of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, verse 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Now, before the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus, he was already pleasing his father. The father was well pleased with his son's obedience. Receiving the Holy Spirit as Jesus did is contingent on obedience to the Lord's commands. Later, Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, that is, the Spirit of truth. So according to this, Jesus said, If you want to receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, Keep my commands. And if you truly love me, you will keep my commands. 
we also must keep the Lord's commands in order to receive the Holy Spirit as Jesus did. Keep the Lord's commands is a condition for us to receive the Holy Spirit. Luke 4 verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. Only after that, verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread. It was only after the 40 days of fasting in the desert that Jesus began to perform the signs and wonders which drew many people to him. Only after his fast did Jesus manifest the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit in his ministry. Only after his fast. I'm not saying that we have to fast for 40 days in order for us to minister in the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. But there is a time of seeking the Lord, of prayer, and perhaps some fasting, yes. Only after the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus during his baptism at the Jordan River, and only after his fast of 40 days, did Jesus return in the power of the Spirit to perform miracles. In the same way, in order for our Father to use us effectively in the realm of the miraculous, it is important for us to please our Father in heaven through our obedience, especially in prayer and fasting, both before and after receiving the Holy Spirit. The early disciples were obediently praying for days before the Holy Spirit descended. They were doing this in the upper room. And Jesus ministered in the miraculous only after he fasted for 40 days in obedience to his Father. Again, I'm not saying we have to fast for 40 days but we may have to do some fasting. We can fast in accordance to what the Lord enables us to do. The disciples were totally committed to their Lord Jesus after having spent three years following him, totally committed to him. They were listening to him speak as no man had ever spoken before. They were witnessing the absolutely astonishing miracles that he performed, miracles that no man had ever done. And with their own eyes, they witnessed his bodily ascension up to heaven. They were therefore totally committed to their Lord, even unto death for most of them, for most of those early disciples. In the same way, in order for the Holy Spirit to descend on us as he did on the early disciples. It's important for us to please our Father in heaven by obedience and keeping his commands. Again, in John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. Acts 1, verse 4. Gathering them together, Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. They had to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 8, And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem 
and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. That is the primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to receive power, boldness, to witness for Jesus Christ wherever you are, even to the ends of the earth. Verse 12, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. And so these early disciples were intent, intent on being baptized in the Holy Spirit because they wanted to receive power to be witnesses for their Lord. With one mind, they were devoting themselves to prayer during the days before Pentecost. They were committed. This is obedience which pleases the Lord. Compare that to how we typically receive the Holy Spirit today in some of our meetings. For example, first, in a Holy Spirit baptism service, you have a 30-minute or an hour-long teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then there's prayer, followed by hands laid on us for us to receive the Holy Spirit. I'm sure some of you have gone through this. We are then expected to speak in tongues immediately. If we do not, then we might be coached to speak in tongues. The person will speak in tongues, and then we are asked to imitate them, to repeat after them, to make the same sounds that they make. So this is a frequent practice in the church. Believers are coached to speak in tongues after hands are laid upon them for, receive, for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Well, we do not see this in the Bible. We do not see this in the book of Acts the coaching that we see today in the church for believers to receive the Holy Spirit in order for them to speak in tongues. The early disciples, by contrast, intent on receiving the Spirit, were in prayer and preparation for days before receiving the Holy Spirit. Today they say we don't have to wait. Well, maybe we do have to wait before we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. In doing so, they pleased the Lord. In the same way, disciples today need preparation in their hearts before receiving the Holy Spirit. We ought to be pleasing the Lord. Only then will we receive power and boldness to be witnesses for Jesus, even unto the ends of the earth. It was only after I decided to obey the Lord's calling on my life, it was a full-time calling, that I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Only after I said, yes, Lord, I will serve you full-time, only after that was I baptized in the Holy Spirit. After that, in obedience to the Lord's leading, I took my wife Lucille to what was for me the ends of the earth to proclaim the gospel to those who never heard. I obeyed. The result of our obedience was nine years of fruitful ministry in the jungles of West Borneo in Indonesia. That was entirely the work of the Holy Spirit in us. The book that I wrote, I like to call it The Acts of the Holy Spirit in West Borneo, because that's exactly what it was. I was just a vessel. Yes, I was willing, but I was just a vessel. 
That is the grace of God, the grace of God. After you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, then God can use you in such ways. It is God's grace. Now, let me say something about speaking in tongues. Acts 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They were not coached to speak in tongues, but as the Spirit enabled them, they spoke in other tongues. They did not need to be coached to speak in tongues, as is done today in some meetings. Verse 5, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Therefore, this diverse crowd spoke various languages. There were Jews from various nations who had gathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost, and so they spoke various languages. Verse 6, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking in tongues Galileans? The crowd of Jews coming from different nations was bewildered by the tongues being spoken by the local Galilean Jews. Tongues which were unknown to these Galilean Jews and which they recognized as the languages of the various nations from which they had come. Verse 8, then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language, the language of the nation from which we came? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome. So at Pentecost, there was an understanding of earthly languages, but languages which were unknown to the Galilean Jews speaking those languages. That was the miracle. Verse 11, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? The tongues were clearly understood by the listeners to be declaring the wonders of God. Now, let's look at other instances of speaking in tongues in the book of Acts. Peter preaching at the home of Cornelius to a group of Gentiles. Acts 10. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers, that is the Jewish believers who had come with Peter, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. The tongues spoken that day by the Gentiles were also understood by the Jewish believers as praising God. Now, Paul at Ephesus with the disciples of John the Baptist. If Acts chapter 19. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then, after that, when Paul placed his hands on them, 
the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. The unknown, unknown tongues spoken that day were also understood by the listeners to be prophecies. So on each occasion here, when people spoke in unknown tongues, they were understood by the listeners. But the tongue spoken today at our meetings as, quote, evidence of the baptism, unquote, are almost never understood. I believe you know what I'm talking about. Therefore, there is a problem with this teaching, especially when coaching is required before the believer speaks in tongues. What I, what I am talking about is the teaching that says, Speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, on the day of Pentecost and following instances of people being baptized in the Holy Spirit, the tongues they spoke were understood by the listeners. Today, that is no longer the case. In these Holy Spirit baptism services, when people speak in tongues, we never understand what they are saying. So there's a problem with this teaching. So what should be the real evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit today? What should be the real evidence? Well, let me share with you my position. We are baptized in the Holy Spirit, not simply to speak in tongues, not simply for us to enjoy, quote, abundant life here on earth, not just to receive more of God's blessings in this life, and not only to feel the Lord's presence and love. And that's fine. That's fine. Those things are fine. But it's to be his bold witness. To be his bold witnesses in our Jerusalem, in our Judea, in our Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. So what is the real evidence for being baptized in the Holy Spirit? It should not simply be speaking in tongues, but rather bearing good fruit as bold witnesses of our Lord Jesus Christ, as well as growing in the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which, and what are they? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the real evidence for being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Becoming a bold witness for Jesus. Winning souls for Jesus. As well as growing in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Here is a refilling, a refilling with the Holy Spirit after Peter and John were persecuted following the healing of the lame beggar at the temple gate in Acts chapter 4. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly again. After they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke the word of God boldly. Now that is the evidence of being baptized, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's another instance. Just before Stephen was martyred, Acts 7, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, our spiritual eyes, and I would say our spiritual ears, can be open to see and hear the invisible realm of the kingdom of God. My wife Lucille experienced this about a week ago. It was definitely supernatural. Now, 
Here's an instance of Paul performing an eye-opening miracle with authority when filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 13, 6, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, he believed in Jesus, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. The teaching consisted not only of words, of course, but of a powerful eye-opening miracle done by the leading of the Holy Spirit. After this, it is very likely that a wide door for the gospel was opened in this area through the proconsul, who is now a believer in Jesus. Again, the Holy Spirit gives us boldness to do what is necessary for doors to be opened for the gospel, for us to be witnesses even to the ends of the earth. Now, joy in the Holy Spirit. Acts 13, verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. After my wife and I were baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1977, we were filled with a supernatural joy we had never before experienced in our lives, even though we were already Christians going to church every Sunday. Prophesying by the Holy Spirit. Acts 21. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Now, boldness for the Great Commission. This is the evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Mark 16, verse 15. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Matthew 28, 19. Go and make disciples of all nations. It does take boldness to do this. And this boldness is from the Holy Spirit after we are baptized in him. Here is a special note on Philip's evangelistic meetings in Samaria after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts 8, verse 5. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, and this was after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. We are getting more and more testimonies from India of people who were paralyzed and were miraculously healed and then turned to Jesus. Verse 9, now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, 
and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention, exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. You see, he could do miracles. He could do miracles that really impressed the people. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. The miraculous accompanied this man's sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. Why? Because he saw miraculous works that he could not do with his sorcery. He had totally, totally been outdone. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw, miracles that he himself had never seen. Simon's miracles from sorcery were totally outdone by the miracles the Lord did through Philip. This was after Philip was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Through Philip, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, the Lord did far greater works than Simon could do with his sorcery. We are seeing this over and over and over through our trained harvest workers, especially in India. Someone gets sick or someone is demonized. And so the family takes them to a witch doctor, to a sorcerer. The sorcerer does his thing, performs mantra, performs sacrifices, but the demon does not leave. Finally, out of desperation, they look for a trained Elijah challenge worker. The worker comes to the house, rebukes and commands the demons to leave, and they leave. The family, they are amazed. They accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So many testimonies just like that. On our past mission trips to Africa, which is the birthplace of black magic, the birthplace of voodoo, we would boldly challenge with doctors in public meetings. Typically, that's what I would do in Africa, especially because it is the birthplace of voodoo. Typically, for the first few days of our mission trip in Africa, we would gather together servants of God and train them with the Elijah challenge. We would train them how to heal the sick and cast out demons exactly as Jesus did, as evidence of the gospel. And then after that, we would hold an open air public meeting, inviting people to come to be healed. We invite the blind to come to be healed of their blindness. We invite the lame to come to be healed of their condition. And during that meeting, of course, which doctors come because they consider me as a competitor, a rival. And so we preach the gospel to the crowd which has gathered. Following the preaching, before we actually heal the sick and cast out demons as evidence of the gospel, before that, I challenge the witch doctors. I say, I believe we have witch doctors present in the crowd here today. I would like to invite you to stand up and come to the front and to heal the many sick people, the many demonized people who have come. Come, please, I invite you. Show me how much power you have. Please, witch doctors, come to the front. Perform your witchcraft in front of the crowd. Let us see how much power you have. And then I wait for a minute or two. I look at my watch. No one has ever dared to step forward. You know why? Because they don't have the boldness and they know they cannot do it. And so after that, I say, okay, if that is the case, then we servants of the most high God who created the heavens and the earth, now we are going to pray to our God and ask him to perform miraculous healings as proof that Jesus is his son that Jesus is the only way to him and that he is the one true God who created the heavens and the earth. And after that, I asked the newly trained servants of God and disciples to stand up and come to the front. And then we begin by praying 
to our Father in heaven, asking him to release his supernatural authority and power through his disciples as evidence that the gospel is true, that Jesus is the only way to the one true God. After the prayer, then I say, okay, those of you who have come to be healed, come now to the front. And these newly trained servants of God will lay hands on you one on one, and you will be healed in the name of Jesus. After you are healed, then you will come up to the stage. I will give you the mic and you will testify publicly that you have been miraculously healed of your infirmity in the name of Jesus. And your testimony will be the absolute evidence that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Now, does it take boldness to do this, to issue this kind of challenge to witch doctors in public? Absolutely. Well, where does this boldness come from? Let me tell you, it comes 100% from the Holy Spirit. It's a fulfillment of Acts 1.8. You will receive power, that is boldness, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. And so what happens? Well, the sick come forward. And then I have the newly trained servants of God to lay hands on them, and then to exercise authority over diseases by issuing commands in Jesus' name. And within a several seconds, people are miraculously healed. They come up to the stage. At one time, I remember the stage was full of people. It was just a temporary stage, and I thought the stage was going to collapse because of so many people on the stage who have been healed and were waiting their turn to give their testimony. And so the people testify one after another, after another, after another. Finally, after all the testimonies are done, then I address the crowd. You have seen the proof that the power of our God is so much greater than the power of sorcery, of witchcraft. Now, how many of you want to repent of your sin, of your witchcraft, and give your life to Jesus and follow him alone as your Lord and Savior? And then many people stand up. They stand up and they come streaming to the front to repent of their sin and accept Jesus Christ as their only Lord and Savior. I do this time and time and time again on my mission trips to Africa. I've been to about 12 countries in Africa. That boldness comes only from the Holy Spirit. Now, let's go back to Philip, ministering in Samaria, Acts 5, verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. Verse 15, when Peter and John arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, they had simply been baptized, water baptized, in the name of the Lord Jesus. So you see, they were not automatically baptized in the Holy Spirit after they were baptized in water. But uh, in the church today, especially the evangelical church, they teach that once you are baptized in water, you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit as well. Well, that does not agree with what verse 16 says. The newly baptized believers had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Therefore, believers are not necessarily automatically baptized in the Holy Spirit when they are baptized in water. No. It's a tradition. Baptism is in the Holy Spirit, therefore, can be separate from water baptism. But church tradition says that when you are baptized in water, you are automatically baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's just a tradition, and it does not follow scripture. Acts 5, verse 17. Then Peter and John placed their hands on these newly water baptized people, and then they received the Holy Spirit. Now, 
Philip the evangelist did not have the ability of laying hands on believers for them to receive the Holy Spirit. No, he did not. That's why he had to call Peter and John to come. And Peter and John as apostles, when they laid hands on these newly baptized believers, they received the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. He offered Peter and John money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit as well. Now, Simon, he was a sorcerer. And he made his living by performing miracles using witchcraft. That was how he made money. And here he sees a great opportunity to make more money. Now, interestingly, here's a question. Why didn't Simon offer money instead to Philip? to buy the amazing authority and power he saw at work through Philip to heal the sick. Why didn't he just go to Philip and say, hey, give me this supernatural authority and power over diseases and demons? Instead, he went directly to Peter and John. Why? Simon was a good businessman, and he knew that the Holy Spirit was the source of the healing power the source of the boldness and the healing power and the healing authority. The Holy Spirit was the source. Having the ability to impart the source of the authority and power would be far more profitable to Simon than having just the authority and power itself. You see, this man was a good businessman. He wanted the source of the supernatural authority and power. We see how important it is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit for preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out demons, and fulfilling the Great Commission. How did Peter respond to Simon's offer of money? Let me back up a bit here. I want to correct something. I want to... Uh, I want to adjust something I just said. Uh, before the early disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were already healing the sick and casting out demons using the power and authority that Jesus had given them in Luke chapter 9. Okay, So when the Holy Spirit came, it was not to impart to them power and authority to heal the sick and cast out demons. They already had it. Okay, But I believe that after they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they became even more effective in using the Lord's authority and power to heal the sick and cast out demons as evidence of the gospel. Okay. Now, how did Peter respond to Simon's offer of money? Huh. Acts 8, Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Now, let's look at Paul. Paul, on an occasion on which he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 9, verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so here, Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit and his eyesight is restored through the laying on of the hands of Ananias, a little known believer. He was not an apostle, but God used him to lay hands on Paul for him to be filled with the Holy Spirit and also for his eyesight to be restored. So it is not necessary that you have an apostle to lay hands on you. No, Ananias was not an apostle. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Now, 
There are different ways to receive the Holy Spirit, as we have just seen. It can be through prayer and the laying on of hands, as we see in chapter Acts, excuse me, as we see in Acts chapter 8, Peter and John in Samaria, and Acts 19, where Paul laid hands on the disciples of John the Baptist, through prayer and the laying on of hands, or simply by hearing the word of God. And this took place with the Gentiles when Peter was sharing the gospel with them at the home of Cornelius, the Roman Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. As they heard the word of God from Peter, the Holy Spirit came upon these Gentiles. Or by prayer, according to Luke 11, verse 5 through 19, where Jesus taught us, ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking, knock and keep knocking, according to Luke 11. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Lord gives the Holy Spirit to disciples who reveal their commitment meant by their persistent asking and seeking and knocking as well as through their obedience now some say that there are two kinds of tongues let's look into this matter first corinthians 14 2 for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. Note that the tongues mentioned here as one of the nine gifts of the Spirit are not understood by anyone. Only God understands the tongues, that is, the gift of tongues as one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I, we call them private tongues because no one understands them. We call them the private tongues listed here in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 as one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, which no one understands. They must be different from the tongues spoken at Pentecost in Acts when believers receive the Holy Spirit. Because in Pentecost and following in the book of Acts, the tongues spoken were understood by the Jews who were present. Time and time again, we see the tongues spoken in the book of Acts were understood by those who were present. Okay. But the tongues, as Paul taught in second in First Corinthians 12 and 14, those are the gift of unknown tongues, which no one understands. So I believe it is justified to say that there are two kinds of tongues. Number one, the private tongues that no one understands. And the second kind, the tongues that people speak when they are baptized, when the Holy Spirit, when they are filled with the Holy Spirit and people there understand what the person is saying in the unknown tongue, two different kinds of tongues. Now, here are different terms signifying the very same thing. Filled with the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit, they signify the same thing. The Holy Spirit coming upon believers, the Spirit was given, baptized with the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out. I believe these five terms signify the very same thing. Now, what about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. That is, the common good of the church, of the body of Christ. 
That is what is meant by the common good. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 12, so it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church, the body of Christ. Therefore, it is very clear that the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit, those nine gifts, are primarily for building up believers in the church. Okay, that is extremely clear. But the primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to give us power and boldness to witness to outsiders for our Lord Jesus. You see the difference. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are for, let us say, internal use, for building up the body in the church. But the primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for us to go out and with great boldness proclaim the kingdom of God to unbelievers. You see the difference between the two. It's very clear. One is for within the church, and the other is for outside the church, primarily. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let me share with you a testimony that I just received. A staunch communist in China miraculously healed after 10 years of paralysis and accepts Jesus Christ. Let me just read this to you. A few years back in 2019, uh, we trained eight disciples from mainland China. At that time, we were in Hong Kong, and these eight disciples came across the border into Hong Kong to be trained. These eight began teaching in China what they had learned from us after the training. They went back to China and began training others in China. Now, a Chinese believer taught by one of these eight disciples at first was uncomfortable with this, quote, new teaching, which he had never heard before. But it's actually not new. As you know, it's solidly based upon the Gospels and the Book of Acts. But this Chinese believer sat through the teaching a second time, and seeing that it followed the Bible very closely, he began to open up to it. After a third exposure to the training, this disciple accepted it completely, and he began to apply it for preaching the gospel. Now, his father happened to be acquainted with a man who was a devoted communist. Ten years earlier, this communist had been paralyzed in an accident, and he was totally bedridden and unable to sit up in bed by himself. Time and time again in the past, this communist man had totally dismissed and rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. The disciple who had gone through the Elijah Challenge teaching three times decided to apply what he had been trained to do. He went to the paralyzed communist man, boldly laid his hands on him, and commanded him to get up in the wondrous name of the Messiah, Jesus. Immediately, the man sat up in bed by himself. He felt the supernatural healing power of Jesus Christ tingling through his legs. Then he got up out of bed by himself and he walked. After that, the trained disciple and his father immediately shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with the man. That's the whole purpose of the miracle. The miracle confirms the gospel of Jesus. And so after the miracle, they quickly shared the gospel with this man. The communists then received Jesus as his Lord and Savior. This boldness comes from the Holy Spirit. Boldness to proclaim the kingdom of God, boldness to heal the sick, boldness to cast out demons. The Holy Spirit enables us to minister very boldly. To me, 
That is the real evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Here's a testimony I received just yesterday from India. For four to five years, a woman named Sila, Sila had been paralyzed and bedridden following a severe stroke. A long stay in the hospital along with treatment proved fruitless. After spending so much money on her treatment, Scylla was left discouraged and without hope, paralyzed for up to five years, bedridden. Somehow she heard about our Elijah Challenge workers and she asked them to come to her home. Over a period of five days, our workers ministered to her with supernatural power and authority in the name of our Messiah, Jesus. Now, it takes boldness to minister to a paralyzed person over a period of five days. Typically, what do we do? Well, we go and we minister to that sick person for five, ten minutes. And after that, we say, God bless you. Let God's will be done. Goodbye. And then we leave. It takes boldness to come back the second day. And then the third day, and then the fourth day, and then the fifth day, it takes boldness, boldness to do that. Well, each day saw Scylla's condition improving. Finally, after the five days, she was completely healed. After the gospel was shared with them, Scylla and her entire family accepted Jesus Christ. Again, this kind of boldness to minister to the sick, it comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us to minister very boldly and also with persistence. We do not give up. We do not give up. The Holy Spirit does not allow us to give up. We keep ministering until the person is totally healed and then we tell them about Jesus. Here is Scylla sharing her testimony <laughs> at her face. <laughs> okay. Uh, the um, resolution here is not very good, so we will go on. But she's standing up. It would have been good if she started, if we could see her walking around. Uh, in future videos, we're going to have the person who is lame or paralyzed start walking around as proof that he or she is healed. Okay. <laughs> And so the Holy Spirit gives us boldness to heal the sick and to share the gospel. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So let us ask, let us seek, let us knock, and let's keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking for the Holy Spirit. You can be filled with the Spirit more than once. Next class. Radical grace to bear lasting fruit, like the Apostle Paul. Now, let me just share briefly from Dancing on the Edge of the Earth. And uh, our dear sister Pola, she is now writing a script for a TV series, which will be produced based on Dancing on the Edge of the Earth. If you missed our earlier sharing, or you would like to have the file of Dancing on the Edge, just email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Now, we first arrived in Indonesia in 1978. After 11 months in Indonesia, we returned to the United States where we shared our testimony and the Lord sent us back to Indonesia in May, 1980. We returned to Pontianak in West Borneo. 
there's my wonderful wife, Lucille. She's holding our firstborn daughter, Esther Maria. And now we wait on the Lord's direction for a greater challenge. We want something greater, a greater challenge. We had heard from different people on two occasions about an area called Batu Ambar. This was while we were waiting on the Lord in Pontianak, we heard about an area called Batu Ambar. Now, let me share something about Batu Ambar. It was said that it was a place of great darkness where wilderness and immorality prevailed. The gospel was unknown there in Batu Ambar, and we were told it would be difficult to win souls there. That intrigued me. The Lord had used Elijah to challenge the servants of the false god Baal to a celebrated power encounter on Mount Carmel. And we were looking for such a challenge. After preaching the gospel and planting churches in the two villages of Biang and Minjaya a year before that in 1978, we felt that the Lord would entrust something bigger, a bigger challenge to us. And perhaps Batu Ampad would be that challenge. And so we made preparations to scout out the area first. Now, once again, just like before, we found ourselves in a position of knowing no one and having no contacts in Batu Ampad. We would have to depend completely on the Lord again. Here is a map of West Borneo, also known as West Kalimantan. In 1978, we started out in Pontianak, as we have shared earlier. The Lord led us into the interior where we pastored a church in a town called Sangao for five months. There, the Lord taught me so much as I sought him early in the morning every day. After five months in Sangao, where the Lord made us fruitful, where he taught us so much, then we went on to the two villages of Byang and Menjaya in 1979, where we planted the two churches, something we shared earlier. And now, in 1980, we are back in West Kalimantan, and we hear about the area of Batu Ampar. And so, we hopped on what we call a water bus, and you can only get there through the water. There are no roads from Pontianak to Batu Ampad. And we went to Batu Ampad. So one morning in Pontianak, we board what is called a water bus heading toward Batu Ampad. This is the harbor of Pontianak. So we set sail on the river and then into the open sea. A few, hours, a few hours later, at about 10 o'clock at night, I wandered to the back of the boat where, alone, I looked up at the gloriously bejeweled nighttime sky, and I prayed, Father, thank you for taking us to Batu Ampar. Father, show us your glory there. Manifest your power and glory that many may believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. For you, Father, you are the living God, the one who created all that I see above my head tonight. There are none like you, Father. Only you are worthy to receive glory and honor and praise. I continued to worship him for several minutes more, my eyes fixated on the starry heavens above created by my God. Suddenly, I noticed a distant milky haze over the horizon in the direction we were heading. I looked into the blackness, the sky over me, and I could make out many specks of light in the distance. It was the town of Batu Ampad. I continued my prayer. Oh, Father, give me this area. Father, give me Batu Ampad. Let me take this area for thy kingdom. Enable me to proclaim your word in the power of the Holy Spirit with signs and wonders following. Father, let me glorify your name here. Within a half hour, we arrived at the dock of Batu Ampad. Now, this is Batu Ampad during the day, during the day. But when we arrived, it was 1030 at night. 
we disembarked onto the dock from the water taxi. But despite the hour, 10.30 at night, Batu Ampar's harbor bustled with activity. People were everywhere. Well, we had arrived, but not knowing where to go, we had never been there. We didn't know anyone there. We just ambled up the boardwalk, which led into town. The boardwalk ended at a dirt path, which went to our left and to our right. Streams of people walked the path in either direction. We didn't know whether to turn left or to turn right, but somehow we chose to turn left and we were swept into a wave of pedestrians. There were no cars or paved roads, only a single dirt path lined on either side with houses, with stores, with coffee shops, some lit up with bright kerosene pressure lanterns, others with electric lights. On our right, we passed a movie theater playing a low-grade Kung Fu martial arts movie. This is one of the two movie theaters in Batu Ampar. They actually had two movie theaters there. Crowds of people, young men and women, parents with their young children, milled outside the theater waiting for the next feature to begin. Large horn speakers attached to the outside of the movie theater amplified the din of the movie inside on the screen, right out onto the theater courtyard outside. Beyond the movie theater, we passed dilapidated sawmill housing on the left and more stores and coffee houses on the other side of the dirt path. Everywhere, people engrossed in the pleasures of nightlife in Batu Ampar. This is Main Street, Batu Ampar, during the day. As you can see, there are no paved roads, only a dirt path. And this is downtown Batu Ampar, okay? Give you an idea of what this is, what this was. As we walked, we had no idea where we were going, but we continued to pray silently to the Lord for his guidance. Suddenly, as we were approaching a second movie theater, I developed an urge for some ice cream. I do like ice cream, okay, but healthy ice cream. Just beyond the theater was a coffee shop. I pulled Lucille off the path and we sat down at an outside table, a table outside of this warunkopi, which means coffee house. And so we took off our knapsacks and we put them down. And then a young woman came out to take our order. We ordered ice cream and the young lady went back inside to prepare the order. Shortly, the young lady returned with our so-called ice cream, which was actually crushed ice spiced with red sugar water. That's all it was. And setting the two dishes in front of us, speaking in the Hakka dialect of Chinese, she asked, are you two from the ocean freighter? You see, large ocean freighters, many from foreign countries, frequented the harbor to pick up sawn timber produced in the 10 sawmills which had sprouted up around Batu Ampad within the last 10 years. While their ships were being loaded, the crews went on shore leave in Batu Ampad. Since our waitress knew by our appearance that we were not local people, she had assumed that we had come ashore from one of the ocean freighters anchored in the harbor. And Lucille said, uh, no, 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 we're not. We've come to Batu Ampa to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. The young lady looked blankly at Lucille. And so Lucille continued, have you ever heard of Jesus Christ? Uh, no, I've never heard of it. And then there was a pause. <laughs> Uh, Lucille asked, uh, is there a hotel here where we could spend the night? And the young lady said, uh, no, the only hotel was burned to the ground in the big fire that we had here a few months ago. It hasn't been rebuilt yet. And I thought to myself after Lucille translated her answer to me, oh, that's great. Oh, Lord, where are we going to stay, Lord? Please provide a place for us here. Then the young lady suddenly offered, hey, why don't you stay here in my place? My husband and I live here with his parents, she said. Now, 
the coffee house where we were sitting occupied the front half of the bottom floor in this two-story house. And the young woman said, I'm sure we can find you a place to sleep in our house here, maybe somewhere upstairs, and I'll cook for you. Praise the Lord, I whispered in my heart. His wonders never cease. And so that night, we stayed with our new friend, whose name was Akim, and her family. They were extremely gracious to us. Her parents-in-law not only welcomed us to their home, but they even gave us their own bed to sleep in. Her parents-in-law moved into the living room where they slept on the floor. They did this unusual act of kindness for us who were total strangers. It must have been the Lord. The Lord's favor was upon us. Thank you, Lord. The next morning, we woke up to a satisfying a breakfast of fried eggs prepared by our new young friend, Akim. We had mentioned to Akim's father-in-law that we were looking for a house in Batu Ampad. We wanted to buy a house. So after breakfast, her dad took us out for a look around. About 100 meters down the path, next to a surau, now a surau is a school where Islam is taught, next to a surau, he pointed out to us a house which was up for sale. It was a small, simple wooden dwelling with a yard in front. We went inside. We spoke to the owner, and the house was ours for about 1600 U.S. dollars. What a deal. Now, our plan was to begin the work in Batuambad with a big outdoor miracle crusade. And so leaflets were printed up announcing a, quote, night of miracles each day for three days. Fresh from our recent success in the villages of Biang and Menjaya, we were now ready for the big time. Yes, glorious of miracles of healing and multitudes of pagans went to Jesus Christ. Batu Ampad would shortly be ours. But the Lord had a better plan for us. Come next week and I'll share with you what the Lord had for us. This narration was taken from Dancing on the Edge of the Earth. If you'd like to have it, email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. If you can, please stay for some fellowship and for some healing ministry from Brother Teddy, Brother Allen, and their team. So thank you for joining us today. I'll see you next Saturday. The Lord bless you all.